afternoon, our text is from God's Word, as the Lord Jesus taught us to, to pray in the second petition, your kingdom come, and we'll look at Lord's Day 48, Lord's Day 48, where we confess the following concerning this second petition. Lord's Day 48, what is the second petition, your kingdom come, that is, so rule us by your word and spirit, that more and more we submit to you. Preserve and increase your church. Destroy the works of the devil, every power that raises itself against you, and every conspiracy against your holy word. Do all this until the fullness of your kingdom comes, wherein you shall be all in all. <clears throat> Congregation of our Lord and Jesus Christ, We read that the disciples in, in the Gospels, that the disciples at one time asked the Lord Jesus to, to teach them to pray. I mean, think about it, it's not really such a strange question. I think most of us may have asked that at some point in our lives, and, in, and sometimes even today people will, will ask and say, you know what, I really don't know how to pray. Is there a way that you could, someone could teach me how to pray? It also reminds us that, that prayer isn't something that, that just comes naturally. Prayer is something that we, we need to learn. But it's also something that we constantly need to be growing in, so that we're never finished growing, you know, also in, we may say, the art of praying. When the, Lord, when the disciples themselves were with the Lord Jesus, they witnessed how the Lord Jesus himself was always faithful in prayer. There must have been no doubt. There were times that the Lord Jesus sat down and he prayed with his disciples. But you also read very, you read very often within the Gospels that there are occasions when the Lord Jesus would, with, would withdraw from his disciples. He would go to a quiet place in order that he might go and pray uh, to the Father. Well, Luke tells us in, in chapter 11, verse 1, uh, that one day the Lord Jesus was praying in a certain place, and, and when he had finished praying, then the disciples at that point asked him if he could also teach them to pray. Well, you know, it's not as if the disciples had never learned how to pray. For the Jews offered many prayers to God. They offered prayers when they would bring their sacrifices to God in the temple. Uh, they, they prayed at their, their meal times. They would pray in the beginning of the day. They would pray at the end of the day. And they would also pray in, in their synagogues every Sabbath day when they met together to worship God. And so the disciples, they understood how important prayer was also for their own spiritual life. But now they are following the Lord Jesus and they are his disciples. And, and they realize, no, there's something different about the teaching of the Lord Jesus. He's not like the other rabbis in, in the land. For he came and he also proclaimed to them that he himself is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. And, and he spoke to them about his own relationship with his Father in heaven, and, and they could see how important that relationship was to him in the fact that, that he was constantly in prayer and he would take opportunities to go and to pray to his Father in heaven. Now we don't know whether there was any specific thing that triggered this particular request at, at this time in Luke 11. But when the disciples ask the Lord Jesus, teach us how to pray, the Lord honors their request when he says to them, go and pray like this. And then he teaches them the Lord's prayer, which is to be the model for their prayers. But you should also keep in mind that this prayer, which we today often referred to as a model prayer, that in this prayer the Lord Jesus does not show his disciples a whole new way of, of praying. In fact, when you look at each of the petitions, then you notice that the Old Testament church already prayed all of those things. For example, when he says, hallowed be your name, then the psalmists often also prayed and they, in their songs. They spoke about the fact that God's name might indeed be hallowed here in this world. And so the book of Psalms, you can say, really is a collection of prayers uh, to God. 
And in the Psalms, this collection of prayers, you might say, that were sung by the people of Israel to the Lord God in heaven, all the themes that, that Jesus mentions also here in this model prayer are found back. Well, here in the second petition, which we'll deal with this afternoon, the Lord Jesus says, pray, your kingdom come. That too is a very common theme that is found in, in many of the Psalms. The psalmist would often cry out to God, God, come and, and rule over the earth. They would cry out to God, God, come and establish your just rule in all the earth. They cry out to the Lord God, God, come and, and rule the earth with justice and, and with equity. And so there was already in Israel a longing and a thirst among God's people that the kingdom of God might come and, and that it might be established over the whole earth. And now Jesus teaches his disciples that this must now also be their prayer. And this needs to be the prayer of the saints also in the New Testament. When we know the Lord Jesus as our Lord, there then will also be this longing in our heart that our Savior may come and that he establishes his righteous rule over the whole earth. The cry of the church today is the same as that of the saints there long ago in the Old Testament. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Come, establish your good and your righteous rule over the whole earth. And so this afternoon, we will confess God's word under this theme. The church prays for the kingdom of God to come. So the church prays for the kingdom of God to come. We look at three things. First of all, we'll see that the church celebrates God's kingship in her prayer. Secondly, the church prays that all nations be brought under his rule. And thirdly, the church longs for God to rule the world with justice and equity. The scriptural theme of the kingdom of God is a theme that generates lots and lots and lots of discussion among biblical scholars. There have been books and books that have been written about the theme about the kingdom of God in, in the scriptures. And it generates so much discussion because the scriptures speak about the kingdom of God, you might say, in a very fluid way. It means that in different places you'll find it speaks about the kingdom in, in different kinds of ways and connotations. Now the Bible will, will speak about God as, as the king, but the Bible also says that the king is still coming. And then you also read that, that God is a God who rules over, over the earth, while at the same time you read places where God's people cry that God may come and he may rule over the earth. You know, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, uh, there at the beginning of his gospel, Mark tells us that when Jesus began his, his earthly ministry, he went to Galilee, and there he proclaimed good news. And this, Mark says, is what he was proclaiming. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. So you notice the Lord Jesus proclaims here that he has come, that he might establish the kingdom on this earth. The kingdom is near because he has come to establish it. But when he teaches his disciples to pray, notice what he says. He says, pray like this, your kingdom come. And so there is then an element that the kingdom, you can say, is already here. Christ has already established it. And there is still the element that the kingdom is still coming. And so what, what scholars today often struggle with and, and write books and books and books about really isn't such a big issue for the simple believer. You find that in the book of Psalms. The psalmist, they, they praise God as the, the mighty God of heaven and earth. And in the very next breath, they cry out to God, God, come and subdue the nations under your rule. And so indeed, the psalmist acknowledges God is, is the almighty king who rules. And, and, and yet, the faithful believer also understands that the world has not yet been subdued under God's mighty rule. And so there's this desire in, in the heart of God's people. That God may yet reveal himself to all of mankind as the almighty ruler. That all peoples and all nations come and submit to his righteous rule. And therefore Jesus then prays, or teaches us to pray, your kingdom come. 
That's been the cry, you can say, of God's people throughout the ages. Here in the book of Psalms, uh, it continues then to, to be still so very relevant also for us today. The themes in the, in the Psalms were, were not just for, for God's Old Testament people, but we find these universal themes are still relevant also for us in our day. It's the reason that the New Testament church, already the early church, they continued to, to sing the Psalms in, in their worship of God, and, and the church throughout the ages has sung the Psalms, although today we kind of come into a, a time where we find many churches have kind of turned away from the Psalms. Well, those are old documents. Those are old books. And really don't, people say, don't really speak to us. They're not really relevant for us. Well, those are, re- are universal themes. If we don't understand the themes in the Psalms, we really don't understand the relationship that we have with God and the relationship that God has with us. Because we love it, the Psalms are key to understanding the relationship that you have with the Lord your God. And we turn to the Psalms. The Psalms, God's people, they, they celebrate God's kingship. They praise God because he is the great king of Israel. And they acknowledge God is not like the gods of the other nations who have no power and who are no gods. God isn't like the idols that are the creation of man's own hands. No, God is the almighty God. And so we read from Psalm 93. In Psalm 93, verse 1, the psalmist proclaims, he says, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from eternity. So you notice God is the everlasting king, the king who is ruling already from eternity. The psalmist then also show that reveal that his power, he has revealed his power there in his creation. And there already in his creation, he reveals his authority over all the earth. Why? Because it was at his command uh, that the waters were separated from the land so that there was land and that there was sea. At his command, the sun was made to give light uh, to the earth. And at the command of God, the earth was filled with all good things, including also mankind made after the image of God. So God is the master of all of creation. So the Psalms praise God for his marvelous creation. Think, for example, of Psalm 104, verse 2. God wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. But God is more. More than just a mighty creator. Because Israel also, also celebrates that this very God is also their God and he is their king. Psalm 47. Psalm 47, the psalmist commands the nations to observe how the God of Israel has subdued the nations under uh, their feet and how God has chosen the land of Canaan to be their inheritance. You hear that joy in verse 5 of Psalm 47. Verse 5, when the psalmist says, God has ascended. He's ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord, amid the sounding of trumpets, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. Notice here what Israel's joy is, that uh, that God has ascended up to Jerusalem, and there he has established his throne in his temple. And Psalm 47, verse 8 says, God is seated on his holy throne. And then you can jump over to Psalm 99, verse 1, and it says, The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. So you notice the people here, they they rejoice because God is a God who is seated on his throne. Where? Between the cherubim. Remember the cherubim are the the angels that were guarding the the throne of God on on the ark that was set there in the most holy place. And they covered uh, there the, the mercy seat of God. And this is where God made his throne there in the temple in Jerusalem. So this is what God has done, the psalmist says. God has set up his throne there in the midst of his people Israel. 
And he claims Jerusalem as his very own city, Zion. And there he sits on his throne, there in the most holy place in his temple. Now that was evidence. Evidence for the people of Israel that the Lord God, who is the creator of heaven and earth, is now also our king. The Almighty God reigns. He has established His throne here in the temple in Jerusalem. And so they rejoice. But in Israel, there's also an awareness that Israel's king, with David and his descendants after him, that they were set upon the throne by God, and therefore they were what we call theocratic kings. I mean, these are kings whom God has appointed to rule as, as His representative here on this earth. David himself, remember, was very much aware uh, that he was representing the Lord God here on this earth. But there's also this, uh, this awareness, also among the psalmists, an awareness that is now also now made clear among the people of Israel, that God is going to raise up from David one who is greater than David, one who will rule on his throne, the throne of David, forever and ever for eternity. Remember David says in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord, there's Yahweh, the God of Israel, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Notice here David then also recognizes God says to my Lord, in other words, he says to my son who is greater, who is superior to me. And so David here also recognizes that the one that's going to come from his household will be greater than him and that he holds them up in reverence. And so there in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, the people of Israel, uh, they were then also looking forward to the coming of the, the great son of David who would be the Messiah, who would be the Redeemer of Israel. Notice then, beloved, this, as we look then through the Psalms in this way. Notice that in the Psalms, Israel praises God as the Almighty God who rules from Jerusalem. But they also pray through these Psalms that God would fulfill his promise to David that he would send the great king who would come and who would rule forever on the throne of David. And that's why when, when the Lord Jesus, when, when he begins his ministry, that's why he proclaims to the people in Galilee in Mark 1, verse 15, that the time has come. What time? The kingdom is near. Why? Because the king of Israel has come. The king that the people have been praying for for centuries through the Psalms. Jesus Christ, he is the great son of David who has come as the king of the world. Finally, all those generations who have sung for his coming Prayer has been answered in the most wonderful way. And therefore today, beloved, we can sing those words from Psalm 47. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, amid the sounding of trumpets. Yes, we too can sing those words because we know that our God and our Savior has now ascended into heaven and there he now sits on the throne at the right hand of God. The one who's ascended is the, very, is the son of David, who is also the very son of God. And there he now reigns over all the universe. And so you hear the saints in Revelation 11, verse 17, reflect those words of the Old Testament Psalms. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. Those words, Revelation, they are sung towards the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very Son of God. And so the saints also praise Him as, as the fulfillment of that wonderful promise of God, that God would reign through His great Son. And therefore, beloved, this, this petition, in this petition, that the first thing that we do is we praise our God, and we praise His Son, Jesus Christ, because God and His Son is now our King. We praise Him, for the Lord God Almighty, He reigns. He reigns over the whole world. Praise the Lord. Now in this petition, the church also prays that, that all nations and all peoples may be brought under His rule. 
Psalm 47, again, calls all nations to, to shout to God, for Yahweh Most High is awesome. And then Israel praises the Lord, for he has subdued nations under their feet. And so when they, they praise God uh, here in Psalm 47, they're also thinking here about what God did in the past. Think about how God has defeated the Egyptians when he delivered Israel out of slavery. They remembered how he has destroyed the nations of Canaan when they came, came into the land and, and, and they conquered it. And then God gave that whole land to his people Israel. And then after they had conquered the land, what did God do? God went and he ascended to his throne there in Jerusalem. That's in the first half of Psalm 47. But in the second half of the psalm, when God now ascends his throne in Jerusalem, then you read that, that he will bring all the nations of the world under his rule. Notice verse 7. Verse 7 says, For God is the, is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. Or skip down to verse 9. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. See, beloved, when, when God ascends to his throne in Jerusalem, there in the temple, God claims, you can say that, that little piece of land on which the temple is standing. He claims that for himself. You can almost say like God is, is now creating a beachhead in this world there in the temple in Jerusalem. The temple, you can say, is, is the one place in the whole world uh, that is holy. Holy. And therefore, it's the one place where God then also dwells here on this earth. And if you remember the descriptions about how the temple was to be built and, and the description of, of the carvings that are in the temple, and then there were the pomegranates and there were the vines and the flowers and, and, and all those, those things represented a garden. Of course, it was to, to remind the people of Israel about paradise in the beginning. But God's purpose in establishing the temple in Jerusalem is not just that he might reign over that, that small little part of the world that belonged to the people of, of Israel. It's not God's intention that he should just reign over that, that piece of land that's called Canaan. But from this small place, this beachhead that he now has there in Jerusalem and there in, the, in his temple, there the Lord God is going to go out and from there he will fill the whole world with his glory. You see how the singing of Psalm 47 then impacts the way that the Jews are also thinking about the kingdom of God. As they sing this song, they realize God is not just going to reign over Jerusalem. He's not just going to reign over uh, no, a few small square kilometers called Judah. He's not just going to reign over what's called Israel. But he will reign over all the nations and over all the peoples of the world. And then Psalm 98 speaks about the extent of God's holy rule. Psalm 98 says, the Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. And then there is a command to the nations in verse 4 of Psalm 98, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, burst into jubilant song with music, make music to the Lord. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. And then in Psalm 99 verse 1, we read, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and your awesome name. He is holy. You know, you can imagine as, as the people were singing those words, and I believe we should be able to imagine that because we do that ourselves when we sing these songs. Then you think about how those psalms also affected the way that the Jews had to think about their God and had to think about the world in which they were living. And yes, God rules in Jerusalem. Yes, God lives there in his temple. But our God is not just a local deity. He's not just a local God. 
that our God will bring all the nations under His rule. So that was the cry. That was the prayer. Those were the hopes of the people of Israel. God is not just concerned about our little, small, little world here in this corner of the earth. But one day, He will bring all the nations under His rule. Praise the Lord. But beloved, for the New Testament believers, that worldview really hasn't changed, has it? Here also here in this petition, the Lord Jesus still teaches us to pray for the very things that, that Israel was praying for in the Psalms. We still cry out and we still pray that God may subdue all the nations under his sovereign rule. Now, of course, we have a perspective that the Jews did not have. Our perspective is one in which we know the Lord Jesus Christ and, and we know that he's the one who has ascended into heaven and that he's now seated there at the right hand of God. And you remember that before the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he said to his disciples in, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. You know what the psalmist so often prayed about in the Psalms is now becoming a reality in the life of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is now seated in authority over the universe. And from there he sends out his disciples so that the kingdom of God may spread out over the whole earth. And it is from, from that beachhead that God, you can say, created there in his temple in Jerusalem. That small little beachhead there, that few square feet there uh, where he made his temple and where there was the most holy place where, his, where, his, where the ark was, was standing. From that place, God now is expanding his work so that it goes out over the whole earth. And so it was also that the temple in Jerusalem needed to be destroyed and it was destroyed in 70 AD. Why? Because the Lord God was now creating a new temple. He's creating a temple now in the hearts, in the lives of his people uh, throughout all the nations of the earth. And here again, the Lord doesn't rule uh, like the kings and the rulers of the world rule. No, he reveals that he's much more powerful. But the weapon that he uses, the weapon of his words, the weapon of his spirit. And therefore the Lord Jesus did not send out his disciples with the weapons of war, but he sent them out with the power of or he sent them out with the word of his gospel. And he also promised them. He says, and wherever you go, wherever you proclaim the gospel, there I will also work powerfully with my spirit. And so, and so Christ is going to bring the nations of this world under his rule uh, through that gospel. And therefore, beloved, the church also prays that the Lord may rule over the hearts of all the nations by bringing them under the submission to his word and to his spirit. His kingdom is no earthly kingdom, but the kingdom of our Lord is a spiritual kingdom. He will work wonderfully by bringing the hearts of mankind under his eternal rule. And therefore we also pray that the Lord will destroy every conspiracy against his holy word. And so our song and our prayer today, beloved, is that our Lord and our King, that he may cause his word to powerfully go out into the world in which we live. And that his word may cause all mankind to fall on their knees and to submit to his will and to praise him as the almighty King of heaven and earth. And therefore, with the Psalms, we continue to, to call out to all of mankind, clap your hands and shout to God with shouts of joy. For how awesome is the Lord God Most High, the great King of all the earth. And then the church also longs for God to rule the world with justice and equity. The Psalms also speak about the kind of king that God is. Reveals that God is a different kind of king and a different kind of ruler than that which we are faced with here in the world in which we live. Psalm 96, 9 and 10 says, Worship the Lord in splendor, in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. 
Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge. He will judge the peoples with equity. In Psalm 96, 13, the psalmist goes on. He says, He, God, will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. We'll go to the next psalm, Psalm 97, 2. Clouds and thick darkness surround him, that is God. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Well, those thick clouds, those thick darkness, they reveal the holiness of God. And so the throne of this holy God, the psalmist set, it says, it, it sets firmly upon two pillars, the pillars of righteousness and the pillar of justice. What it means, beloved, is that when God rules, he will always do what is right and what is good, and he will always be completely and absolutely just in everything that he does. Psalm 98, verse 9 says, Sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Psalm 99, verse 4, The king is mighty, he loves justice. You have established equity. Notice, beloved, how the psalmist it gives this picture of a, of a mighty and awesome king who is just, who never shows favoritism in the judgments that he makes. And yet, you know, so often we also hear the cry in the psalms and also in many of the prophets about the innocent, the cry of the innocent in Israel. The innocent who are being oppressed by their rulers. You see, the reality in this world is that judges and kings and rulers do not always look out to do what is right, and they do not always seek to do what is just. But they're looking out to do what is best for them. And so the poor, they will be oppressed. And even what they have will often be taken away by, from them by the wicked. And so those in power, those in authority, will use it, not in the first place, for the well-being of others, but they're more driven to, to further their own agendas, and often it is evil and a wicked agenda. And beloved, today nothing has really changed in the world in which we live. Uh, in a way you might say, you know, we live in a pretty good world today, or at least we live in a pretty good country, because we live in a country where everybody is subject to the rule of law. And so whether you're, you're wealthy, whether you're poor or not, the, uh, the thought here is that it, we're all controlled by the law and, and, and those in authority cannot be above the law. And yet the reality is even in this situation that those who are wealthy and often those who are in authority, they still manage to, to use their power in order to get their way. And they will even do it at the expense of the innocent. And when you think about the injustice that is done in this world. Then, beloved, then we also remember that the greatest injustice that was ever done was done to our Lord Jesus Christ. When the rulers of Israel, remember these are the spiritual leaders of the church in those days, they conspired together with the rulers of the world, those Roman rulers, in order to put him to death. The innocent was put to death and he was slaughtered on the cross. Well, the amazing story of the gospel is that through this injustice, the Lord Jesus suffered and he died for the sins of his people. The saving work of Jesus Christ really reveals to us, beloved, the kind of king that you really have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not come that he might serve all of humanity uh, to, to come and to serve him at his back and at his call. But when he came to this world, he left behind the glory that he had with his Father in heaven in order that he might come and he might serve us, his people. He gave his life for our lives. He suffered the agony of hell for all of our sins. And so the one who ascended into heaven is the one who first of all descended, you can say, into the pit of misery that we deserve. And therefore, the claim of Christ on us, beloved, today, is that he says, I have bought you with my precious blood. Oh, we deserve to die. We 
deserve to be punished eternally for our sins. But instead, our king came and he bore for us the wrath of God that stood against us. How do we ever, how do we ever praise him enough for what he's done for us? And yet that's what we're called to do in this petition, to praise him. In our songs, in our prayers, we praise our king who has bought us with his precious blood. Beloved, today he rules our hearts and our lives with his word, with his spirit. That means that the place where we should expect to find justice and to expect to find equity is here in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can say if there is one place where the holiness of God should be clearly visible, it is there in the midst of God's people, in the midst of the church. For here in the church, the Lord rules us with his word and with his spirit. And yet, and yet the reality is, beloved, that even in the church, there is still so much that is not right, so much that is not pure. We don't always find the justice and the equity that we long for. And therefore, in this petition, we continue to pray, Lord, Lord, your kingdom come. We still long for that day when our King will appear from heaven. Then the cry of the saints of the Old and the New Testament will finally be answered in its fullness. When Christ comes, then he will judge all the peoples of this earth. On that day, the devil and all those who conspired with him against the Lord Jesus and against his people will come under the judgment of Christ. On the day of judgment, Christ will come. He will bring justice into the world. On that day, he will punish all those who have oppressed his people and who refuse to serve him as almighty king. On that day, beloved, all the powers of wickedness and darkness will be completely destroyed. Then our Lord, he will come and he will establish the kingdom in its fullness. And we, his people, on that day, we will then indeed praise him. As you read about that also in the book of Revelation, for the Lord God Almighty, He reigns. And that day the glory of God will, will fill all the earth. And the people will cry, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are all His judgments. Hallelujah! For our Lord, uh, for our Lord God Almighty, He reigns. Amen. Thank you.